Well, welcome everyone to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour we're on Saga 960 AM News Talk Radio. I have the privilege every week, uh, every day, Monday through Friday at six o'clock to bring you interesting people. And I got to tell you, one of the most interesting people that I've met in my time uh, in uh, Mississauga, um, as some of you may know, I was president of the Mississauga Arts Council and I had the pleasure of giving this young lady the uh, award, a Marty Award for the top uh, performing uh, person that year. And she deserves a lot more awards than what uh, the Mississauga Arts Council uh, ever gave her, but it was nice that the Mississauga Arts uh, Council uh, could give her an award. And this is Suzanne Howe. How am I pronounced it right? Perfect. Suzanne Howe, who uh, is a violinist, a uh, classical violinist. Um, she uh, grew up in Mississauga. She, uh, she uh, trained in Mississauga, but then she ended up going to, what was it, Juilliard in, uh, in, uh, in Manhattan and became a top performer there and has now performed around the world and travels around the world. Uh, and she has a fascinating story that maybe she'll tell us a little bit about where her, uh, her father was a conductor in, uh, in China, in Shanghai, I think it was, and, uh, and left and, uh, and came to Canada uh, and, uh, and trained her and, uh, and uh, practiced her uh, uh, nonstop. So she ended up becoming such an incredible violinist. And uh, she was very proud a couple of years to go back to China and play one of his favorite, if not uh, the favorite uh, pieces that he's ever done. Anyway, Suzanne Howe, uh, welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian. It's an honor to be. Uh, it's on, uh, an honor to be on your radio, and um, it's a pleasure to be back in Mississauga. So, tell me, uh, you're here in, in in social isolation, or in uh, in in, uh, in whatever we call it, uh, spatial uh, social distancing, physical distancing, um, with your parents who are uh, Mississauga residents. Uh, must be tough for you to not be performing, not traveling around the world. It is. It is. Uh, it feels a little bit like the first vacation I've had in about 20 years. <laughs> it's amazing because I, I think even while I was a student at Juilliard, uh, I was moving nonstop. I was making two transatlantic flights per month. And I mean, at the moment, everything is grounded and uh, we just don't move anymore. And it feels, um, uh, it feels honestly quite nice to be able to see winter turn to spring uh, here in Canada, although we had a little bit of a snowfall, but it melted, of course, within a, within an hour. And um, uh, so far, for, for me, I'm relishing in, um, in this staycation. Excellent. So, so let's, you know, update us, please. Uh, so the last uh, I uh, heard of you, we gave you the Marty and you performed a couple of wonderful concerts uh, here in Toronto for, uh, um, you know, a big uh, Chinese uh, New Year banquet, and then you embarked on a worldwide tour. Where did the worldwide tour take you? Oh, my goodness. Well, I think we started in London. Uh, I was uh, performing and recording with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and um, I have since returned back to London to, to perform with the Royal Philharmonic again. So a couple of trips to London, and with the Royal Philharmonic, we went to um, Taiwan and China, on a uh, on a two week tour, and um, uh, we made a recording of the uh, Butterfly Lovers Concerto, the Sansons uh, Introduction in Nordic Capriccioso, and also two Chinese works. One written by uh, Fritz Kreisler, the Tambourine Chinois, uh, and another work by a uh, Yang Baozi, which is a Chinese composer. So it was a really a, um, a bridge of uh, East and West uh, culture in musical form, and each piece in the CD was actually inspired by an earlier composition that was on the CD. So it's, it's really quite, uh, it was an honor to, um, to be able to record this, this as, you, as you mentioned, this incredibly celebrated um, violin concerto, a very unique piece uh, that my father was in fact asked to play and um, asked to make the first uh, recording, but uh, we were already on our way to Canada, immigrating to Canada at the time. So um, he was unable to make that recording, that first recording. And so now the world has to suffer with mine recording <laughs> of this piece. And, and I remember you telling me a little bit about the uh, piece. It's about uh, two lovers that, uh, that uh, don't end up uh, sort of unrequited love, I guess would be the right description of it, correct? Yes, yes, exactly. It is, it is the Chinese version of uh, Romeo and Juliet. And in fact, it came uh, over a thousand years before the Shakespearean um, uh, and Italian and uh, Arthur Brooks versions of the Romeo and Juliet as well. Uh, it was written in the Jing Dynasty. And at that time, uh, girls were not permitted to go to school. Uh, 
uh, much like everybody right now. <laughs> Nobody's going to school. Um, uh, and uh, she, the, the, our main uh, lead, who is written as the violin, um, she uh, begs and begs her father to allow her to go to school. And finally, she, she goes with her hair hidden under her hat and um and uh off she goes and yeah i i um i find this uh particularly interesting to talk about now because so many of those themes are still ever present today um we talk about education we talk about uh, uh femininity uh masculinity we talk about um gender uh equality differences uh, we talk about um, finding oneself, and in the finding oneself uh, discovery uh, category, is it, it's even more I feel relevant today as we're completely isolated. I'm reminded about how people get to know each other well, and how um, people get to know themselves. I think that when you're quarantined and socially isolated, spending a lot more time with yourself. Uh, exactly. Never, it's a pleasure to reach out and uh, reacquaint with uh, favorite people in the world like yourself. But then also, it's helpful to spend some time alone and uh, and think about who you are and and uh, and what you're all about. Right. And and um and also, I I appreciate the refocus on health yeah. because um we are never more aware of our health than when we're sick or when people around us are sick. Uh, we always forget about it. Like every time I remember, every single time in my entire life I ever had a cold, I'd be like, I am really going to appreciate it when I'm healthy. And then when I'm healthy, I forget. Yep. And this is the best reminder that we should really cherish our health to respect uh, and take care of ourselves and our loved ones. And, oh, gosh, and our loved ones. And I know you have... Uh, Elderly parents. Uh, my uh, mom uh, lives on her own, 88 years old, and uh, and we are not uh, going to go see her. Um, we uh, are making a point of uh, of distancing, but we're reaching out on a fairly regular basis, and the whole family has got together to sort of uh, try a little harder than we would normally try to make sure, because she is a social animal, and uh, loves her bridge, and loves her church, and loves her uh, her coffee parties, and uh, and she's missing all that, and uh, and so I think it's important for. For all of us to reach out uh, to people that, uh, that that are socially isolated, and and it really reminds me of how important her health is, as well as my own health. Right. And do do you find that the value of real face to face time will increase? One. I do. I, you know, I think so. You know, we're chatting on Zoom, uh, and we were joking earlier about uh, how you interact with people. Um, I find that uh, you know, once you've had a a um, a face to face meeting with someone you can certainly keep up uh, via text or keep up via email or keep up versus uh, via telephone, but um, actually seeing someone and seeing the facial interaction, um, uh, the the physical you know body movements, uh, the way that uh, people uh, respond is so critically important and uh, and and you miss that when you've got uh, text. I did a fasting interview with a lady who ran a video uh, company. And she said that she thought today video was 15% of internet traffic, but in the future it would be 85% of video traffic mm -hmm. because uh, emails um, are becoming sort of like the faxes of, uh, of today, uh, you know, and faxes were the medium that we used a decade ago. Um, but uh, email took over and, and she thought that emails would go the way of the fax machine uh, and that we would. Uh, and, and one of her examples was how many times do you get a text with an emoticon in it? The reason why is just the text by itself doesn't convey emotion. And so therefore people add an emoticon to mm -hmm. add emotion. Um, and even that obviously texts aren't, uh, aren't satisfactory. And so therefore videos are where we're going. And so therefore people are using videos to, uh, to send out um, snippets of their performance, which I'm hoping that you might uh, do for us later on today, um, or for resumes. People are sending out video resumes, or people are uh, posting videos. Uh, um, I interviewed uh, the other day a person that was doing uh, online dating. She was talking about how people are using videos for dating. Uh, and so I think people are using video a lot more. Uh, this video uh, CEO, she quoted that 95% of French teenagers are on something called TikTok. I've never even hmm. heard about TikTok until that time. Um, and what it is, is just a video sharing type service for teenagers. Well, for everybody, but teenagers who use it. 
Anyway, we're going to take a break and come back more with Suzanne Howe, a fantastic classic violinist, in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, good evening and welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting with Suzanne Howe, a wonderful classical violinist uh, who, uh, as I mentioned, I had the pleasure of giving a Marty Award to uh, and I was president of the Mississauga Arts Council because she, more than almost anyone I know, deserved it as a top performing artist. Uh, she uh, trained at Juilliard. Uh, she's uh, traveled around the world, as we've heard. And, uh, and she's got her start here in Mississauga. And Suzanne, I think there's a, an interesting story that uh, you told me once about uh, you've got small hands or something like this, and your father had to do something such that you could actually play the violin. Tell us about that, if you could. Yeah, I wish everybody could see my hands right now. Um, my pinky finger doesn't cross the knuckle line. Um, that first knuckle line of my third finger. And um, I can't remember the exact measurement of my pinky, but it is the shortest pinky finger. And my hands are the short, or the smallest hands of any professional uh, violinist in the world. I've compared even in Japan and China and Korea, everywhere, um, the smallest hands that exist. And if I had grown up in China, um, Shanghai Conservatory would not have accepted me to study violin because they consider it a, a disability to have a, a small hands. But my father being a violinist, my mother being a violinist, and me having just this love for uh, the violin, he said, okay, we'll, we'll do it anyway. And he trained me especially uh, to get around on this instrument. And my, um, you know, I consider myself very fortunate in my lifetime because if my parents didn't believe in me, if they didn't encourage me, and um, teach me and practice with me every day, I would never be playing this instrument. There would be no chance. And I have long thought that it's uh, uh, something that I'd like to share with the world. So this year, in fact, if we can actually get out the door ever again, um, this year we are starting to film um, a series called Paganini for Little Hands. And Paganini is considered the most challenging pieces ever written for the violin. It is the Bible of violin technique. And it is what my father used to tra train my hands starting at age nine and a half, uh, because he knew that without these uh, incredibly challenging etudes at a very young age, I would never be able to um, actually get around on the instrument, let alone uh, do what I'm doing today. So he's trained me in very specific ways to optimize um, energy flow, to optimize uh, position, posture, and um, movement. And he practiced with me every minute of my entire life from when I started three, four years old until I was 12 and went to New York and studied with Dorothy Delay. So with you every minute of your every life. Every minute. Every minute. You must have been a pretty tough uh, taskmaster. He was, he was pretty tough. He said, I remember he said to me, um, I had two tough jobs, the job of a father and the job of a teacher. And he said, as a father, I had the responsibility to give you an education and encourage you to do what you love. And as your teacher, I have the responsibility to be strict. <laughs> and he said, so... <laughs> I had to do all of those things and it's not easy to balance. And um, thankfully he was incredibly intelligent about how he uh, had my, my, my word, my promise of work and work ethic. And I never questioned a minute, but he also stayed with me. Uh, so I was never alone. And um, it, I find that particularly relevant today as we are all alone in isolation. And what does that mean? I think that there are many things that we accomplish when we have the energy of somebody else around better than if we were alone. And still, I mean, I am practicing in, in isolation practically all the rest of my life. I mean, my practice rooms and in Juilliard and my hotel rooms and, and even in trains, planes and automobiles and whatever, I practiced always alone thereafter. But those early years to have somebody there yeah. um, monitoring and encouraging and giving you that sense of belief that even if it fails 10,000 times on that 10,000 and first time, it will work. That's something that I don't think you play something 10,000 times. I'm pretty sure that we play every piece of music at least 10,000 times before we go on stage. <laughs> um, and I do know that we practice 10,000 hours. So within those 10,000 hours uh, before playing, I mean, yeah, 
I, I, I remember an exercise that he took me through once and it was with the Paganini where, um, uh, uh, this was, this was, uh, this only happened once, but I, I couldn't get this one phrase and I just told him it was impossible. And he said, it's not impossible. And he said, look, just play it through 10 times perfectly without any faults and we'll go have dinner because mom, you know, finished dinner and we're both hungry. I said, okay, okay. All right. 10 times doesn't take very long, probably less than a, a, a minute. And he said, but there's a catch. If you mess up once, we're going to add three times. I said, okay. I, I, I wasn't, um, I don't think, I think I was nine, 10 years old at the time, maybe younger. Didn't quite click in what this meant. So I went from 10 times, nine times, eight times, up to 11, back down to 10, up to 13, back down to 12, up to 15, up to 18, up to 21. And you can see where this goes. So after a hundred, I started crying. And he said, crying's not gonna help, keep going. And he said, I'm gonna stay here with you. Nobody's eating, nobody's doing anything. Mom will reheat dinner, don't worry. We're gonna get through this. It, the, that number went up to 217. Oh my God. It was midnight before I got through. But I'll tell you, the last 100 100 times. 217 times. That one phrase that lasts about maybe four seconds. You've got to play that phrase for us. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Out of the blue. <laughs> it only lasts like four seconds. Only 10 times. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I mean, I suppose the theory is the theory is once you've played it like that many times, it should come out no matter what. <laughs> All right, let me see. Let me see. Great, sorry? What a great story. That's it. Did you do it right? Yeah, actually. <laughs> that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. <laughs> it was just one phrase like that, but they're running, uh, running thirds. What are running and thirds? Yeah, and there are shifts, uh, shifts and everything that uh, happen in between, and um, and uh, double stops very, very quickly. Spiccato. Fantastic. Was- and then, and then you went to New York when you were twelve. Yeah, they drove me. My parents drove me overnight, twenty-four hour uh, driving back and forth. We would leave at about three o'clock in the morning to arrive in New York around eleven, twelve. Uh, night driving was a little bit quicker. Uh, I think we got a speeding ticket every single trip. And, um, and then I would stay and have my very, very long lesson and we would return about 2, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. and arrive around midnight or 1, one o'clock in the morning, stop for dinner somewhere. And I'm, I'm sorry, this was a lesson with? Dorothy Dilley in, uh, in New York. And we went uh, until I was 18 and went to Juilliard. And how often would you go to New York? Uh, every three to four weeks. Every three to four weeks. And you're still training with your father, obviously. Yeah, in between, yeah. And she's uh, obviously a well-known uh, teacher? Yes, yes. She's a uh, an incredible violin pedagogue, and um, she has taught every single famous violinist in the entire world, oh, starting from Isaac Perlman, Josh Bell, down to little old me. And then, and then is Juilliard next? Juilliard, um, you mean? In your chrono- chronology, after this. Yes, and then when, when I was 18, I went to uh, Juilliard. I did all my degrees there, bachelor's, uh, master's, and uh, the performance doctorate called uh, Artist Diploma. Now, some of uh, these uh, um, you know, movies or shows that depict Juilliard as a pretty tough place. Was it a pretty tough place? Uh, well, I wasn't there very often because in my, <laughs> I was practicing all the time in my first year. In the second year, I won my competition and I was going to Europe twice a month. So I wasn't there a lot. Um, but I have to say that um, I didn't really enjoy practicing on the practice floor because it really did feel like um, you were on a farm with uh, musicians and everybody was practicing their concerto and and it was hyper, hyper competitive. And it is, it is a, a, not as supportive of an environment. And I suppose it pushes you um, to excel. Uh, but, but there are some aspects that um, 
at least at the time i know they're 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 aware of that and they're they're working on creating that uh nurturing environment more so now right. but um at the time there really wasn't so much uh uh helping i remember i i remember i i um had a friend uh who was struggling with the passage and i i you know because of my teeny tiny hands i uh, showed him how i got around those kind of phrases and and i, I remember he looked at me and he was like why are you telling me this and i was like well because you were having trouble with it and this helps right <laughs> he was like yeah but nobody helps what if you help everybody they're going to be better than you oh, god and i just re i remember thinking what an odd way if i mean if somebody needs help you help that's it was just my my logic there's no other way and um i suppose there's a lot of naivety to that but in fact no and today um that's what i want to do is to help and that's what this program is about is to share all of these secrets all of these trade secrets that will help enable anybody to tackle these incredibly challenging pieces because the next generation if they can get through this they'll be much much better and uh and uh we'll all be better off <laughs> do you have another piece that you would consider playing for us please oh i well i thought um i thought i'd i'd, I'd try to uh conclude at least a little bit the uh the beethoven spring sonata and go to the third movement since the uh, uh no for, sorry the fourth movement um since um since we started with the first movement incomplete so maybe we can do an incomplete uh, phrase or two from the from the fourth movement that would be awesome Let's see if I can. suzanne howe again playing from her living room in mississauga oh. in social isolation during covid19 right Fantastic. live from the living room and you are on my piano <laughs> so different without piano i mean i as i as i started suggesting playing a, a piece like this i always imagine the entire uh ensemble playing it and it's um it is different it's so different playing it alone but it is how i practice it's just that when i'm practicing i'm repeating things 217 times and nobody wants to hear that so <laughs> Well, we'll have to, we'll have to, if uh, this uh, self-isolation goes on uh, much longer, we'll have to do another show and bring in a, uh, a pianist by Zoom. Yeah, just to see if we can do that. I thought it would start, um, yeah, I, I thought if people get bored enough, if we get, uh, uh, we, I, I, I might start, um, you know, sharing some of my work process because uh, I am preparing the Beethoven Violin Concerto for this this season, as well as, well as the Bruch uh, Scottish Fantasy. Um, the what Scottish Fantasy? Bruch uh, Sp Scottish Fantasy. Um, what's that? Bruch, I'm actually playing in Hamilton in uh, October, I believe, and the the Beethoven is opening the season in uh, in Poland. So. Um, well, I'd love to go to Hamilton. I doubt I'll go to Poland to see you. <laughs> well. I'm, yeah, we'll see if I get to Poland. <laughs> when are you playing in Poland? Fingers crossed. In uh, Krakow. When? Krakow. Uh, it's in September. Oh, you should, we, we should be okay by then, I hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I hope. So it must be nice coming back to Mississauga to have some time to rehearse and to spend with your parents. It really is. I mean, I, I, um, I, I must say that, you know, I wasn't here last year 2019 i think i think i wasn't here practically at all i had maybe less than a week here all mm -hmm. last year so i was really looking forward to seeing 
everybody, the whole family, friends, and all kinds of social get-togethers uh, scheduled, and everything has been canceled, of course. And so, um, a year of waiting. Ah, oh, what's another few weeks? Maybe months. Well, it's great to have you uh, back in Mississauga. We're going to take another break and come back uh, with some concluding uh, comments with Suzanne Howe in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, we're back with Suzanne Howe, a incredible uh, classical violinist. And, uh, and you've told us, Suzanne, about your story, about your father, uh, 10,000 uh, practices and 217 uh, perfectly done right. Um, you told us about uh, driving to New York. You've told us about Juilliard. You've told us about traveling the world and performing in beautiful concert halls. Um, if someone is listening tonight and has a dream of being something like you, what, what suggestions have you got? Uh, patience. Have a lot of patience. Um, I think that um, we are often not patient or kind enough to ourselves. And I think that what I, what I had growing up with my father practicing with me was this incredible uh, belief and somebody who just sat there and patiently took me through the process because nothing ever comes easy, especially on, uh, on instruments. And I think that for the most part, many things that are worthwhile do not come easily. But if we... Anything that's worthwhile do not come easily. No, that's really anything fine. that's worthwhile does not come easily. And if it does come easily, it doesn't always last. Um, I do think that... Um, applicable to uh, a lot of things in life. Right, right. I, I, I believe that very strongly. And I think that, I think that um, the other thing is that if there's something that anybody really wants to do, they should do it no matter what anybody says. If they really have a love and a passion for something... Even if that genre or kind of music or kind of creation or kind of art doesn't exist yet, they should just create it. And nobody can stop them. And I think that that comes with incredible, incredible passion that um, we don't do it because we might get paid, because we might be good at it, because we, there's so many because of this, of that, of whatever. I think if somebody's truly, truly passionate about doing something, they'll do it no matter what. They'll, do it. they'll Not just because of money, but because they're passionate about it. Right. And I think that when they're truly passionate about it, that kind of passion is infectious and the world will respond. So be patient, um, be uh, kind to yourself. Um, if you're passionate about something, do it. What else? Uh, and, and then I think, Carrying those through every single step along the way. I mean, that's, applica that's applicable to so, so much of that journey. Because... Um, what do you mean? Hard work? Right. For instance, I mean, patience also within opportunities. Because many people are looking for quick opportunities. They want, uh, you know, they have a piece ready and they want it to come right away. Oh, piece is ready. I want to perform it. Well... It doesn't always come right away and good things are worth waiting for. And I can certainly say that um, going through the years that I did in, in my career, I made some extremely difficult choices, some unconventional choices and choices that uh, others would have considered considered give me an example. completely career debilitating, mm -hmm. like turning down opportunities. But I was given incredible opportunities to play music that I didn't love. And I said, I'm not the best advocate for this music. If I'm not passionate about it, it is not, I'm not going to be the, the best medium for it to come through. And, um, and yet that would have been a huge opportunity for me to step up and, and, and play. But I think that that would have um, diminished, one, my, the purity of my love and, and passion for my instrument. And, and Second, it would have diluted the, the purpose of music for me. It was not for the opportunity. I play it because I love it. So what's and, next for uh, Suzanne Howe? Hmm? What's next for you? You talked about uh, you're going to release a, a CD this year. What else? Anything, anything else? Uh, we're releasing actually two uh, videos this, this year. One is in... Uh, uh, to celebrate Beethoven's 225th, uh, 250th birthday, sorry. Um, and that's going to be the Beethoven uh, 
violin concerto with the London Symphony Orchestra plus the documentary that was filmed along with it. Um, and the second is The Butterfly Lovers, which was a live capture of the Beijing performance, the one that we talked about it. Yep. Uh, and that uh, will also be re released this year. Um, filming the series, uh, Paganini uh, for Little Hands, is uh, is coming up uh, and that's going to be a huge uh, production. Um, and I think a long production period as well, because uh, we have a lot to do. And, um, and then concerts. And um, uh, I'm also starting, and, and this is uh, uh, not yet um, ready to be announced really to, to public, but I'm starting um, some one-on-one -on -one workshops with artists that I've already uh, worked with in the past. So by invitation only at the moment, I'm started to uh, mentor some young artists, especially those who I feel have a very unique offering to the world, those who are trying to do something that has never been done before and don't really know how to, to do that. Um, choosing unconventional paths takes incredible support yeah. and an ecosystem of people that believe in them and who can help introduce them to the right people at the right time and that's an ecosystem that is not always available to people and sometimes that will never come so if i can um, help make some connections if i can uh help give that sense of um validity and support and belief in these young writers that are venturing to do something uh brave and courageous uh with their lives uh then then that certainly I feel is a very worthwhile cause. And um, so that's actually starting this well. Uh, not going to announce the date now that, <laughs> now that we're currently in this situation in the world, but um, uh, it's certainly also something that is launching this, this year. Wonderful. And uh, if uh, people want to check out your music, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Uh, I am on virtually everything. So starting from Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, everywhere, and um, Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter, everything under Suzanne Howe and each S Suzanne Howe. Z? Suzanne, sorry? Suzanne with a Z? Suzanne with an S. An S, not a Z. But even if you spell it wrong, it'll come up. <laughs> and the spelling of your last name? How H-O-U. So H -O -U. Suzanne? Suzanne How H-O-U. Excellent. And assuming that we're back to normal by the fall, your next performance in Southern Ontario is in Hamilton? My next performance here in Canada is in Hamilton, indeed. Yeah, Amazing. it's in October. And With I the Hamilton Philharmonic, I believe, in Hamilton Place. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, lots of our listeners will be there because Suzanne Howe is someone who deserves to be heard because she is just a spectacular talent and uh, one of the nicest people that I've had the pleasure of meeting in the artistic community, whether in Mississauga or uh, anywhere in the world. So Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Thank you, Brian. And it's so wonderful that you're reaching out to everybody. And thank you for also bringing an incredible uh, community of people on your radio. It's uh, I've enjoyed uh, listening to the broadcasts and um, uh, it's, it's certainly welcome and needed. To another one with a pianist sometime. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Suzanne Howe. Check her out on Spotify or Apple Music or uh, with the Hamilton Philharmonica in Hamilton in October. Good night, everybody. Bye.
And so they, they part, and in some way, in that moment, they both die of a broken heart. Except that Romeo, Romeo Sipa, actually does die of a broken heart. And uh, he very quickly has a funeral. And did I mention that day, she's supposed to go marry somebody else. So she asks for the, the wedding procession to go by his freshly dug grave. And as she walks by, she begs the skies, the heavens, for a miracle. And they strike open the tomb and the earth, and uh, she jumps inside to, to join her woman. So the bit that I'm going to play now is her actually making this decision that she needs to see him one last time. And she's not quite sure what she's going to beg for uh, when she sees him in the earth, um, but the miracle thereafter is that, uh, well, there's reincarnation, <laughs> bruises his own, and uh, the heavens grant them an eternal life as butterflies together. So, a um, little bit of a, a dramatic difference in the character, so we first, we first have to experience her losing the light. <laughs> 